Welcome to my Rayman 3 Fan Remake Devlog series. I invite you to join me as I talk about my journey of learning Unreal Engine and programming. I will go over how I made this blank scene turn into this. Come on, I'm kidding. Hey, I like that outfit on you. When does it come off? I'll be showing the models I've made, C++ code, and blueprint code. Alright, let's dive in. Welcome to the 13th episode of my devlog series that happens to come out on Friday the 13th. Spooky. Coming into this area, there were two things that I was sure about really. One is that I wanted to have this nice shadow on the floor coming from the glass ceiling. And the other one was changing the wall texture a little bit because honestly I'm really not a fan of it it's somehow very noisy and chaotic it's just I don't know to me it kind of lacks readabil readability it might be just my opinion but you know my opinion usually gets all the votes around here let's run through this area so we're all on the same page about what I'm trying to make here there are some of these critters that I actually don't have still up to this day. It's a button platform. Here the piggy banks get introduced. Which I need to destroy in order to progress. And there's this area with some more glass windows. And there's another platform. Teaching you about the curved punches. And a cutscene. All right. Since this was the first interior area that I've made for this project, uh, I had to make a lot of new assets, so as per usual, let's go rapid fire through some models. So here's the map geometry and the corridor leading to this room. For the wall texture, I first sculpted it in ZBrush. As you can see, it's a little simpler than the original one, but still similar, I would say. I also wanted it to resemble in some way the exterior shell of the Fairy Council Tower. I feel like this way it reinforces the idea that you are inside of that tower. And here's the texture baked onto a plane and painted in Substance Painter. This environment is also where I sculpted and painted this project's first trim sheet texture. A trim sheet texture is kind of similar to a texture atlas where you have different smaller textures packed into one which you can use to kind of quickly build models that seem more complex than they actually are. And just like that, I have textures on my level geometry. This is looking incredibly empty, so let's get on with the rest of the models. Let's start off with these glowing pillars. I'm really liking the patterns the shadows are making on the walls from those pillars. We also have the button platform. the door. I'm having a hard time finding the ZBrush file for this one, so straight to Unreal. There's also this pillar structure over here. Okay, mystery solved. So here's the door model actually. These piggy bank archways. This one has two versions, one that's open and one that's closed.
I gave these crystals some glow as well as made to look like there's something moving inside. So while I'm at it, let me quickly talk about the shader because it uses a node that I haven't used before in this project and that's the bump offset node. This node basically gives the illusion of depth as I use this bump offset with this noise texture that's panning around the crystal which you can see on the sphere on the left. Yeah, so with this node it looks like this noise pattern is somewhere deep inside the crystal. If I disable it, this kind of lose this effect. This floor model was actually also sculpted, which you can tell by all the crack detail. Then we have these square platforms. There are a lot of glass surfaces in this interior, so I'll talk about the shader in a moment once I finish going through the models. The second button platform. This glass ceiling or floor, depending on how you're looking at it. I have these stairs. Sculpting in stairs is really not a great approach. Stairs come in too many different shapes and sizes to sculpt them all by hand. It's just that at the time I didn't have a better idea, so I decided to sculpt them anyway and call it a day. Mind you, this is still back before anyone saw this project, so I was keeping in mind the possibility that no one would care once I uploaded the gameplay video onto YouTube and I would just move on to different things. However, I can assure you that this is the last set of stairs that I sculpted because nowadays I have a different approach, but I'll keep a little bit of mystery and not talk about how I make stairs in this video yet. Anyway, let's get back to the models. We got this bridge over here. This bridge over here. Then the glass windows and the glass ceiling. I can't find the models for these again. Maybe one day I'll stumble across them accidentally just like with the door. I'll be the first to admit that I don't really like how the glass looks on these. I'll probably redo this in the future. Although I can't say the same for the ceiling. I really like this heart pattern that I made and how it glows. What's really bugging me right now is how flat the wall texture looks. You can clearly see it's just a texture. It doesn't really hold the same quality as the other sculpted models because of how flat it is. Wait, who's that? Oh, hello, Nanite Desolation. Tessellation basically dynamically subdivides your mesh in order to create more detail. If we look at the wireframe of this wall that I have over here, you can see that the geometry is very basic. It's very low poly. But then if I enable nanite tessellation, it creates all the polygons required to hold all of this detail. So this is a feature introduced in Unreal Engine 5.2. I'm not going to go over how to enable this because it's a little different depending on if you're using Unreal 5.2, 5.3 or 5.4. But if this is something you want to try out, it's pretty easy to find a tutorial on how to enable it for the version of your choosing anywhere on YouTube. I'm just going to jump right into what matters and that's the height map that I created and how it's connected in the shader graph. So here's the height map I baked out in Marmoset Toolbag. It's just a black and white texture where all the darker areas will be pushed inward into the mesh and all the brighter areas will get pushed outward. A little tip I can give, I usually find that blurring the height map sometimes gives better results near areas where there's a big change in color because any sharp changes 
can give pretty jagged edges on your mesh in those areas. So now for the shader, honestly, all you can do is just connect the height map right into this displacement channel, and that would be enough. But I wanted to have a little more control, so I created all of these nodes over here to be able to change the, the tiling of the texture, the offset, and the rotation. As well as I have this displacement strength over here, a parameter that allows me to dial in the strength of the mesh displacement. If you're using Unreal Engine 5.4, then honestly, you don't really need this displacement strength because you can just change the displacement on the material instance over here, the magnitude. However, this doesn't really work in Unreal Engine 5.3, which is the version I'm using. So that's why I have this little node over here. Now for the windows, the metal frame comes from a texture that I created, this one over here. Just like all the other ones, this also came from a ZBrush sculpt. I wanted these windows to be actually transparent instead of how they were in the original. So to make this glass material, I followed this tutorial right over here. Although if I'm remembering correctly, the gist of it was that once you set your blend mode to translucent, you need to set your lighting mode to surface translucency volume or surface forward shading. These are pretty expensive, but it's just the way I have it, at least for now. Okay, so the next step was to throw around some of the assets that I've already created around the room, just to make it look a little more, I don't know, it just looks better, it feels less empty. Also using some of the foliage that I've created on the walls. By the way, all those smaller pebbles were laid out using the physical layout tool. It's a free Unreal Engine plugin, that's really cool. It kind of allows you to throw down assets using physics, so it takes much less time and looks pretty natural. One thing to note though, it is pretty buggy and often crashes Unreal Engine 5. However, William Fauschner has a great tutorial on how to use this tool because he also goes into how to avoid those crashes and kind of work around this tool to have a better experience using it. Okay, I'd like to talk about the lighting right now a little bit. So I wanted to have this dark gloomy feel in this room, kind of like it was back in the original. Um, I changed the direction of the directional light to make it go through the windows like this. I also increase the density of the fog, so you have these god rays coming through the windows. I also can't change the color of the light to a more green tone. I just like this combo of this kind of violet blue with the green. I also changed the horizon color of the sky sphere to a green color so it matches the light source. Outside behind the windows, I throw around some stuff <laughs> just to make it look like there's some kind of world behind this, these windows. I also put some fog cards from the William Fauschner Easy Fog asset, the same one I used when discussing uh, making the exterior area. And then the as a bit of a cherry on the top, I put two fog cards here underneath this window. It's very subtle, but I think it adds a lot. For the piggy bank room, I didn't deviate much from the original. I just made it be this kind of magical, calming blue color. Now this next room, I went for more of an orange color because of the giant orange window, window on the top. But... Honestly, I'm not sure if I'm entirely happy with the lighting in this room. I think it maybe feels a little flat or could, or could just do with some more contrasts. So it's very possible that in the future, I will tweak it a little bit to maybe make the orange light a little weaker or anything else. Or I don't know, I'll try some stuff and see. Okay, why don't we take a closer look at the piggy banks now? Oh, 
Piggy banks in Rayman have these two properties. One is where you have to charge your fist to a certain amount to destroy them. Hitting them with your regular fist won't damage them at all. And the second one is that when you destroy them, they usually spawn something for you like crystals or health orbs. So let's go have a look at the blueprint where I created this functionality. So once the piggy bank gets hit by something, we check if the damage is above a certain threshold. Let's say that it wasn't because the fall spin is a little simpler, so let's start with it. All that happens here is we play a hit sound and a timeline makes the piggy bank just jump a little bit, like it was in the original. But then if we met this minimal damage threshold, we of course add the points because you get points for destroying the piggy bank. And then here's all the logic that spawns the contents of the piggy bank. So first of all, I have this number of rewards variable over here that can be changed on the instance. So I can make a piggy bank spawn any amount of rewards that I want. So I plug in the number of rewards into a for loop. So the proper amount of rewards gets spawned. And in the loop body, we basically spawn an actor. The actor we spawn is a variable called piggy contents. And this is also a variable I can change on the piggy bank instance. So I can make a piggy bank spawn pretty much any actor that I want. Like I could make a piggy bank spawn, I don't know, 10 enemies, which would be pretty funny. So I spawn the actor at the location of the piggy bank. And then I rotate the spawned actor a set amount. So later on, once the reward is spawned, I will just move the reward in relation to its forward vector. I'll just illustrate how this works to make it clearer. Let's say the number of rewards is 3. So we divide 360 by 3, which gives us 120. And then we multiply this by the index of the loop iteration. So the first index is 0, so 120 times 0 is 0. So the first actor will spawn with a 0 out rotation. Now the second one will spawn with a rotation of 120. And the third one will spawn with a rotation of 240. Now if I start moving each one of these rewards in relation to its own forward vector, they will flare out nicely in a circle. Now to create this behavior in code, first I create a array of the spawned actors, and then once the loop body is completed, well first I spawn a destroy piggy bank particle system, but that's not important right now. I hide the piggy bank and disable its collision, and then I use a timeline to move each one of these spawned actors, first of all in relation to its forward vector, and then also in the z-axis, I move it up and down to make it look like it jumps out. Then once this timeline is finished, I can destroy the piggy bank actor. Okay, let's see this in action. I'm charging my fist. The piggy bank that gets destroyed and we see the crystals jumping out each in its own direction. Just to see this is all working, let's say I have eight number of rewards. We'll spawn in a health orb instead and destroying the piggy bank spawns eight health orbs laid out nice in a circle. And here's a quick peek at the piggy bank destroy particle effect. It's just a cloud of smoke and various parts of the piggy bank spawning. I did add a collision node which causes the various pieces not to fall through the floor. Okay, cool. So the final thing I haven't talked about yet are these platforms. Let's start with the button blueprint. So the button itself doesn't really do anything. The only logic that it has is that whenever it receives damage, it changes the emissive property of its material in order for it to glow. And then I have this custom button off event, which whenever it gets fired, it just causes the button to stop glowing. Oh, and by the way, at this point I did learn about material dynamic instances so I didn't have to come up with a weird workaround that would prevent all the buttons lighting up that share the same material whenever the, one of them is hit kind of like I had with the bouncy mats in one of my previous videos here I just create a dynamic material instance and assign it to this button in begin play so now we have the platform note that I have this button variable that's instance editable so I can connect any button from the level to this platform Pretty much the same way how it was done with the pressure pad and the glow box blocker in the previous episode. And now in the event graph, first of all we have the on take any damage for the button event, which fires whenever the button that's connected to this platform 
receives damage. So whenever it receives damage, this timeline fires, which for the duration of the timeline moves the platform upwards. I also have this branch over here that kind of works like a clamp, limiting how high the platform can go, so you can't move up indefinitely. Anyway, whenever this timeline finishes, then I call the button's button off function, so it stops glowing and the player knows it's time to hit it again. And then event tick pushes the platform downward every frame, as long as the button isn't in its on state, while also limiting its lowest position to its starting position, so the platform never ends up lower than it started. And then finally, to make the button blueprint move up with the platform itself, even though they're not part of the same blueprint, I parent the button to the platform, here in the actual level. Now this second platform over here has the exact same code as the first one to move it upwards. Um, the only difference is, is that the button is not actually parented directly to this platform. It's parented to a platform rotator that's then parented to the platform. What this rotator does is it rotates whenever the button receives damage, forcing the player to hit it from the other side. So this is basically its own separate model. The way I set this up is that whenever the connected button receives damage, this timeline gets played in order to animate the mesh's rotation. However, if the button gets hit again, I need this timeline to reverse the rotation so the mesh goes back to its starting rotation. This is where this reverse boolean comes in. Whenever this timeline finishes, the reverse boolean gets flipped. So if it was true, it becomes false, and if it was false, it becomes true. And then this boolean decides here at the branch whether the timeline should play normally or it should be reversed. Although nowadays, I actually know of a node that's called flip-flop, which I didn't know at the time. So we can simplify this code by deleting all of this. Connecting this to the flip-flop. A goes to play and B goes to reverse. So basically this flip-flop node alternates between option A and B. If the previous option was A, then the next one will be B. If previously it was B, then the next one will be A. I feel like I went pretty quickly through these blueprints, but if you have been following the series, then you've seen similar code in my videos. So I just didn't want to bore you by repeating myself too much. Anyhow, since this was another environment breakdown, why don't we finish this episode with another summary? So counting the level geometry as one model, for this area I made 17 new models, giving us 110 in total. I've created three new master materials, one for the displacement wall shader, one for the glass, and one for the crystals at the piggy bank room. So altogether that's 16. For texture sets, this time we don't have any dedicated texture sets, but we have overall three new ones. One for the wall, one for the window frame, and one for the trim sheet. So overall we have 21 texture sets right now. And then there's this one new particle system when the piggy bank gets destroyed. So that's 13 particle systems in total. Okay, thank you very much for watching. I hope you had a good time. In the next episode, I would like to take a closer look at the characters and cutscenes. Hope to see you next time, and I wish you all a very good day.